fact, there's three of us on this paper. So I'm Keith May from Historic England and University of South Wales. James Taylor's here from the Department of Archaeology in York University. And Steve Roscombs, who can't be with us because he's doing even better things out, I believe, digging on a site of a small Roman town near York. But he said, sends his best wishes. And we wish him well. Um, where are we going? So we're going to look, uh, to some extent, at, at, at some more of the basics of the, of the, of the stratigraphic process as, as Wyatt introduced it, I think, in his introduction. There's some good stuff in that that relates to what we're going to talk about. As a background for this, some of this comes out of work that I've done on trying to draw together uh, digital archive data, stratigraphic records, in order to do sort of cross-searching and, and, and more advanced semantic technology technological searching across archaeological data sets and I sort of flagging up in some of this some of the issues we've come across there and and we'll talk a bit more about uh, uh, how that feeds into work that we're interested in, in taking forward obviously for those that maybe don't know some of these things the background there have been a number of, of, of computerized approaches to recording stratigraphic data particularly what we would call matrix data so things like the, the Bond seriation matrix package, something called ARC-ED, as an example up here, which was, was early but useful work in sort of correlating and, and checking matrices, checking that your stratigraphic relationships were accurate and, and that you weren't having um, faults in, in the relationships that you, you'd put into your uh, context records. Ed Harris himself, who we always talk about the Harris Matrix, there has actually produced now a piece of software, as we see in the middle, something called the Harris Matrix Composer, which I believe you, you can download freely. And if you've got a very small site, you can put 50 records in it, but it actually costs money. If you, and, and, and there's all these sorts of issues around how projects use these different tools and whether you have the right resources to create records. And what we found, we put up the a shameless plug for the somebody who makes Excel, I guess, on there. But <laughs> yeah. a lot of archaeologists, when we've actually looked through records of, of earlier excavations, you know, from the last 20, 30 years, even where they have been, com say, computerized, there, there are digital records in, in archives like the Archaeology Data Service in England. A lot of these things are just in, in spreadsheet format and not necessarily in formats that are, uh, are, are actually easily uh, processable by a computer and... and allow us to, to just take them as data and, and search across them so easily. So if I press that, does it do it? Yes. So in order to sort of look at how we might better use the data and search across them, we've kind of gone back to, to the principles of what, what we're doing this for. And of course, James will talk a bit more about his experiences with this. But we, we, we've gone back to the basics, which I think was in the introduction as well. That, but Harris, in terms of the, when he set out these, these stratigraphic laws as used by archaeologists, went back to the, 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 well, the geological principle of, of superposition. And, and he really asserts sort of three, the three main areas that we looked at is the kind of the theories and laws in his first book on, on archaeological stratigraphy. There's questions around the recording practice. How do you actually record that in the field? And I think that's really fundamental that we have to remember that a lot of the people aren't actually recording it on databases but they're recording on these bits of paper with the, these box diagrams so I just wave that in the air as well to remind us that it's not all that straightforward if we're lucky as we move forward I think more of it is being recorded primarily digitally and that's that's I guess what we're trying to look forward to in terms of how we might reuse that data but we've also been looking at some of the issues particularly some of the work I, I did earlier where there's a tool for, for recording uh, relationships in the field, but what we do with it after we come out of the field in what we, for want of a better term, call post-excavation analysis or, or off-site analysis or further analysis, people referred to it as it an interesting phrase used in the earlier paper about uh, that, that, that referred to quite ephemeral things we do afterwards that we may not be apparent immediately in the field. And I thought that was that was interesting. Um, so that's the sort of the principles behind this. And as I say, in practice, one of the issues we came across when we were trying to put data sets together for searching, both in, in work that I have done and, and, and as other people have come across when they've looked through archive data, actual consistency in how these things are recorded. I say there's Excel sheets, but they're not 
even recording in a sort of standardized way on those sheets. And certainly what is deposited is often not a full record of, of all the stratigraphic relationships. So there's sort of limited consistency at the moment in those in the in, in what we're what we're actually archiving. Some limited consistency, I think, in as I say, these these later processes, perhaps even less consistency once we get off site in in how people actually record stuff. Because what people want to use the matrix and the stratigraphic information for is obviously to start writing the books and writing the reports. And at that point, people tend to put their phasing information into text sections and, and put it, basically create, create it verbally. But that doesn't always get reflected back into the digital record. So I think there are questions in this about how we're going to actually be more consistent in our approach. And, and, and that, that again is reflected in, in, to some extent, the question of what people want to use that data for. As I said, what information is most useful to other people? And I've said reuseful there, particularly because there's, there's a lot of sort of groundswell now, I think as, as data it is becoming more readily available and potentially getting bigger and bigger if we're going to go down to centimeter size, then we've really got to think about how we're going to store that in a way that allows everyone to, to, to cross it and manage, manage those data sets in the same way and, and, in, and understand them and, and search across them in, in the same way. So sure, it's useful to have these tools if you're just working on one site. I think we often just focus on what we need to do for our particular site. But I think we also need to think about if there's going to be, if we're going to do more multiple sites, and we want to actually understand how they join up. Then there is there's an there's an obligation, I would say, on us to actually sort of try and present this information in a more a more standardised way, so that we can can work work with it in in, in multiple forms and 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 find find the relationships between those different sets of of information. And I think, I'll just that example there, you can see the, the kind of it's just there to illustrate the kinds of multitudes of ways in which that stuff turn, turns up in the archive and yet yet we're trying we're trying to make it work together to that point I'm going to take over for a second um, so I want to think through there we, we want to think through some of the processes of um, really it's the off-site processes of analysis of stratigraphy that are quite common um, um, particularly in this sort of analog way of dealing with strat but perhaps still have relevance to some of the more technological methods as well that might come out in this session. Um, now, and this really, these next few slides are Steve's part, part of it, and they're very much rooted in material that he's written in his book um, on excavation and the stuff he's published about stratigraphic stuff over the years. So we were thinking through, you know, the, 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 analyst, the analytical process, if you like, a stratigraphic analysis is very much linked to this idea of correlating things. Um, so, you know, you summarise on site your descriptive information and then you spend some time with the record um, traditionally um, getting all those context sheets out, getting all those plans out and correlating them horizontally and then thinking about um, how you block things together and how they correlate vertically and, uh, and then go back and, re uh, you know, there's an iterative process of going back to the spatial record, the plans, the GIS um, quite often these days. And then out of that, you draw these higher order interpretation. And I think it's those higher order interpretations in particular that Keith um, is interested in, um, uh, in terms of, you know, linking across different sites. And by this, I'm talking about the features and the, particularly the phases and, the, and, and, the, and those sort of higher order temporalities. Um, and the thing is that those things can be difficult to get to. We're not always very explicit about the way in which we group things and the, the sort of temporalities that we are trying to deal with um, off-site, um, how we get to phases or levels and the rationales behind that. There's a lot of published material on um, recording techniques and so on, but the analytical techniques are, are, are a little more of a dark art, I think, probably. Um, and that... It, Essentially, it's rooted in an interpretative process, an iterative interpretive process, which you may or may not begin either in or out of the field, depending on the way you record things. So, um, <coughs> one of the first sort of orders of, of, of analysis that we've, we've, we've sort of identified is this idea of grouping units, stratigraphic units, or context, if you're doing single context recording. 
Um, and of course, the grouping um, process is looking at how you understand the lowest order. You know, how individual actions, of depositional actions or events, if you like, can make up a, a broader activity. Um, and um, each sort of different type of group is a sort of abstraction, if you like, of a spatial temporal concept that inherits the, the, the stratigraphic relationships of the underlying matrix. So you should be able to construct a group matrix if you're doing it in this way. And this has specific implications for increased complexity, if you like, in the spatial temporal relationships at a group level. Um, I put a little example up here from Chapel Hill where you can see, um, does this have a pointer on it or not? Yes, it does. Different features. So you've got a pit retrieval, a post retrieval sequence here compared to a platform sequence here, which has um, burials and, uh, and resurfacing events all over it. And they both have different like group numbers, feature numbers, if, if, as we call them at Chapel Hill. But you can see there's a, a much, much different sort of sense of complexity in the two different types of groups um, uh, and, and a different implied temporality. There's a whole sequence in here um, compared to perhaps one or two events in this one. So it, there's, there's a sort of whole bunch of subtleties um, linked to these grouping process that are often not very implicit. How do right, okay. I'll, I'll work it. So going out even broader, you've got higher order temporalities as well, which are often uh, bundled up as sort of periodization. Um, this could be phasing or, or, or periods. Um, and um, uh, <coughs> so groups make up periods in the matrix. We'll let them look at this in the next slide. I'll show how we annotate them at Tattle Hook, but it's quite common. But there are sort of implications um, uh, uh, about um, how big an exposure is being analysed, if you like. So, uh, um, you know, if you look at the whole of London, you might periodise it as three big fires which form periods. Um, but um, sometimes these things don't work at a site-wide level. At Chattel here, uh, oops, uh, Mela identified a whole bunch of levels um, in the 1960s. And as we subsequently come back and looked at the sort of implied temporality of these, we realised they don't work very well at a site-wide level. They're, they're, they're not... So there's a whole sort of bunch of inferences and complexities as well dealing with phasing. Um, and it's not so much the, um, I suppose the, the thesis of this is not necessarily the, the, the mathematics of the matrix that's, uh, that's important as the sort of, or it's as important, if you like, as the interpretation of that matrix as a group or phase that's really, really important. And that's what we want to sort of be more explicit about, I suppose. Um, it would be good to uh, explore ways in which the higher order groupings and the phasing is achieved and what the rationale is behind it and whether there's any commonalities of practice. Okay, I'm going to move on because we are going to run over. Um, just to note, before I hand it back to Key, or oh, before I quickly go through a, a case study, sorry, and then hand back to Key, is that um, uh, these people have been exploring these ideas for a long time, graphically, in the matrices with, with regard to sort of um, looking at certainty and duration of processes and so on and so forth. So there's nothing new in this. Um, <coughs> at Chattel Hoot, I will gloss a little bit over this because I want to come back to what he's saying, but um, it is a complicated site with 20 metres of stratigraphy and we have all these different ideas of um, units and features or groups, if you like, and phases and levels. Phases at the kind of house level and... and and levels at the site are sort of period, site-wide periodization. And the point about this is that I would love, or we, we annotate it in, in a specific sort of way. So we have, we actually just draw our matrices um, and we have units <coughs> and then the features are noted like this as brackets around the units and then the phases are horizontal lines through the matrix. <coughs> and all of these elements are linked into spatial components as well, like buildings and, and spaces. But it would be really good to address um, issues within our data structure of jumping between temporal scales, looking from the stratigraphic unit to the building phase, to the levels. Um, and then also thinking about transitions of states in units as well. The idea that you know a, a wall is, is sometimes active and then it's passive within the environment that it's in and so on. We can maybe pick some of this up in the discussion, but I just want to show that 
you know, there are ways of making the matrix talk to the spatial data um, and drive different visualizations of stratigraphy if, if, you, if you're so minded to do it and code it in, in such a way. And now I'm going to hand back to Keith. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so you sort of saw how James laid it out on his <coughs> Chapel Hewitt matrix. Again, similarly, this is a, a, just a site in, in, in England, Silbury Hill. We're again seeing that phasing divided up by the bandings across. I don't know if I can do it. Oh, now I've killed it. <laughs> it's the red button. Yeah, that one. The, the bandings across here, you've got the phasings in between. But what I want to really show on this is how we're starting to introduce these other temporal relationships that th some of those contexts are occurring during that, that particular phase that is separated by that banding. Some of them, as a bracketed, are overlapping in time. Some of the other relationships are showing that the phases are meeting in time. And this is coming back to this point that was raised, I think, around early in the introduction about the Allen temporal operators and how there are actually other relationships which we kind of put implicitly into our data, but they're not being actually expressed directly, certainly in the Harris matrix. The Harris matrix basically uses those ones. You know, the, we know the before, the after, the above in physically above below and there is that key spatio-temporal aspect to the stratigraphic relationships in that in that, that we see in the ground we can sort of say these things are above below we we create we actually make that sort of temporal distinction based on what we are we are seeing in 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 our excavation technique or we use the occasionally equals one when when, when that comes in as well but what I think I'm trying to say is that, that one of the things that came out of so our modeling work was that, I've, some people will know, I've done quite a lot of work using CDOC CRM ontology, using some of these, these sort of ontological modeling techniques for conceptual, conceptually referencing between different sorts of, of, of relationships between entities. And it, it, it brings out the, 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 the power of, of being able to search and semantically use these other temporal relationships that are in our data, as long as they are in the data sets. And, and this comes back to my earlier plea that one of the problems we, we produce, we were able to use the technologies to do the cross searching, but we so often found that, that the data then didn't actually, it wasn't really consistent enough to fully maximize the power of what we might have been able to do. So part of the reason behind this sort of, this sort of presentation is, is to make a plea that, that people do actually archive and document that, that as well. But we believe that, that we can go forward with, with these techniques to actually potentially make some of that, those relationships we see in those matrix diagrams more explicit. And this, this is just coming back to sort of what I'm talked about, the 5D side and, and this again brings out this idea that I think one of these is that this idea that you've got the sort of starts and there's the starts and finishes side to the, the temporal operators as well but clearly this is also trying to look in the 4D sense where we all know there's this problem of, of how do you represent periods so we, we leap from the micro stratigraphic relationships of individual context to the what does the Iron Age mean stratigraphically across Europe <laughs> That's a small leap, but Iron Age does mean different things according to spatially where you are in Europe. And that, that is why we're also trying to deal with some of those points uh, at a sort of micro stratigraphic level and a macro stratigraphic level. And that, to some extent, is just a refresher on some of the work I've done on this. We've done on this in eight years ago now, which is frightening to think in terms of temporality. But again, that there, there's work here in, in terms of how we, we, we can search across this information if, if we have some of those temporal relationships and, and stratigraphic relationships built in. And this is something that why we are using something now in the Ariadne project called CRM Archeo to try and make that more stratigraphic relationship more explicit. To not do justice to this, but they are going to do a paper after, after the break. So I will sketch over this face. One of the reasons why I, I again think that, the, that these additional relationships are important because working with colleagues at Sheffield and, and Caitlin Buck and Tom Dye here have done a paper on, on, on how they've developed, trying to develop the chronological model inside of this. Tom's done some very interesting work. The diagram on the right here is sort of expressing, again, coming back to how we might find ways of 
expressing the temporality of interfaces, this point that, that actually you mentioned in the introduction, contexts don't just come one on top of the other immediately, but there is a time span in between, and that rope of time diagram expresses that. And the, and the diagram here in, um, in the black and white, again, shows that for Bayesian modeling, while the, 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 the item on the left here shows our, our basic sort of before and after relationship, it's also import, important if, if, if contexts do actually meet in time, or as pointed out in, in, in Diane Buck's paper, that this one can't be expressed stratigraphically currently in the Harris nerve because it, oh, that's the overlaps relationship. There's a question which I put in for me, if nobody asks a question at the end, is would process modelling for an analysis be useful? This is an example of something we've sort of done for excavation. So where there's, it's notable that, that Roskins has written an excava a manual for excavation, but we don't really have a kind of manual for what we do in post-excavation. And at that point, yeah. you're up for... Very, very yeah. briefly then, yeah, to we sum up... 30 seconds before... 30 break. seconds. So uh, ultimately, I think what Keith and I are, are, are looking towards is a series of things, a uh, series of goals that, uh, that are linked to uh, facilitating the reuse and interoperability of stratigraphic data, essentially, and, um, and, and also whether it's possible to, to create analytical tools that can help with the analytical process as well, um, whether that's grouping or phasing or what have you, or potentially wider analysis like Bayesian modeling and so on and so forth. And then, of course, there's this issue of visualization. Stratigraphy is not very easily penetrated. Um, you know, matrices are hard to read. So is there ways like the animation that I've briefly showed before that you might be able to represent and visualize stratigraphy more clearly for wider audiences, which would make it presumably much more useful for telling the story of the site mm -hmm. that you're digging. Um, and then, of course, disseminating it as well. I'm actually going to leave these up on the screen so that we can uh, our sort of concluding sections, which I think just wrap up the kinds of points we've been making about looking for consistent standards of recording and standards in spatial temporal expression and thinking about new modes of visualization and so on. Um, at that point, we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you.